going? Uh, so if you remember when we left off last time, we were in the middle of a Kirchhoff's problem. And uh, we had basically done the, like, the first couple steps of our equation. So we had set up our equation. We had guessed which way our currents are going to go. So we have three currents, I1, I2, I3. We had guessed and we had set up the positive and negative directions. And then we had gotten our equation for the current. And so at our junction here, so your, your junction rule says the currents in should equal the currents going out, OK? Uh, I1 equals I2 plus I3. So I1 is the one coming in. I2 and I3 are the ones coming out. So again, this is the sort of thing uh, when you're doing it, uh, you know, you and your friend could be, have different answers here depending on how you pick the currents. Okay, so it's another thing to sort of be careful. So I just wanted to stop here and just uh, make sure everyone is okay. So we, we picked the currents, we put down our positive negative signs, and now we're about to go through and do our equations. So anybody have any questions on how things were set up uh, to this point here? Because this is kind of a weird you know, thing. When we're first doing this, it takes some getting used to, I think, if you've never done this before. All right, and so now what we're going to do is we have three loops. All right, so here we've got sort of this bottom loop, the top loop, and then the outside loop. And so we've got three different loops. So the bottom loop clockwise from A. And so I pick A. Now, here's the thing. I happen to be going with the direction of the current, but I don't have to. Okay, that's just sort of the way that I did it. If you go the other way, you'll get the exact same equations, just with negative signs instead of positive signs. Okay? And so if we, if we look at this here, if I start at A, the first thing I come to is this guy here. And so the, the reason we do the signs is just to give us a, like a little thing to help us write the equations easier. Again, you don't have to do it this way, but I think when you're first learning, this can be really helpful. So when I come from here, the first sign I come to is positive. So my sign is positive. The current here is I2. The resistor is I1. So the voltage, remember voltage for a resistor is Ohm's law, I times R. So I2 times R1. Uh, then I come to here. The first sign I come to is this positive, right? And so it's positive E2. And then I come down this way. The first sign I come to on this one is negative. So negative E1. And then I come back around and stop here. And then I say equal to 0. So that's my first equation. Uh, my second equation in a similar fashion is the top loop clockwise from A. And so here I'm actually I'm going with I3 and against I2. So again, it shows you you don't have to go with the current. All right. And so here, if I start here, the first sign I come to is this positive sign. And the current I called this one was I3. So the voltage is I3 times R2. And I come over to here. The first sign I come to is negative E2. And then here, the first sign I come to on this one is negative I2 R1. And so then that's my uh, second equation. And finally, the outside loop uh, turns out to be the easiest one. There's not that much stuff here. Uh, so outside loop clockwise from A. So I go to here, I get positive. R2 times I3, and I come over to here, negative epsilon 1, and then I come back to there and get equal to 0. So these are my three equations, again, that I got through the setup. And at this point in this problem, it just becomes an algebra problem, okay, like a high school or, you know, algebra problem from your past, like three equations, three unknowns kind of a thing. Uh, actually, four equations, three unknowns. So we've done the physics part in setting it up. So any questions on that? Anybody got anything they're not clear about how we did this? And again, if I had just gone the other way, if I had gone A and gone the other way, I would have gotten this exact same equation, but there would have been a negative sign in front of everything. And said this equal to 0, you, know, you have the flexibility to multiply this whole side by negative 1 if you want, because negative 1 times 0 doesn't change anything. Okay, so you could have gone any direction. If you had started at some weird point like here, you'd have gotten the same equation, just a little bit mixed up. Okay, but it's the same equation no matter which way you go through and do it. Um, 
And so your loops do not need to go in the same direction as the current. Someone pointed out that in a lot of my videos, I just do it that way. I'm not sure. That wasn't on purpose. So apologies for that. Um, and so now we just want to go through and solve for what we got. And so here's the key, all right? Sometimes people don't explore all their different uh, equations. So right here, if you didn't write down this last equation, this problem tends to be a little bit trickier. Uh, but here, I can take this equation here, and then right away I can see that, well, that gets me that I3 will be equal to epsilon 1 divided by R2. Okay, and so I can write that out sort of right away. And then I go over to here and get my information. Epsilon 1 is 10 volts. Uh, R2 is 10 ohms. And I get 1 amp. Okay, I can also see that this top one over here uh, is actually pretty easy to solve for. And so this here I got from my equation 3. Uh, this one here I get from my equation 1. So I get I2, uh, when I bring this over to be epsilon 1, minus epsilon 2 uh, divided by R1. And so epsilon 1 is 10, this is 5, and so this will be a total of 5 volts here, and my R1 is 10 ohms. And so if I do that, I get, you know, one half of an amp. So like I said, at this point, it's just algebra. You hopefully had an example of that last night. Um, and so we can get I3 and uh, I2 really quickly, and now you have two equations left, and so the easiest way, usually once you have two of them, is to use the junction rule, right? And so here I've got the junction rule, and so I know that I1 equals I2 plus I3, and so I can just say IA plus 0.5, and, I, and so here now I've solved for all the currents, okay? So I've done this problem. So you've basically found everything that you need in this problem now to go through. Now, you know, the problem could ask, like, say, hey, what's the voltage drop across resistor R1. Well, since you know that that's 10, you just take I2 times 10 and find that out. Uh, and then you can also know from your signs which side the higher end is, right? The positive means that's the higher end of that resistor, uh, you know, assuming you got your I1 to come out to be positive. So you're, you're essentially done now. And also another thing is you can always go back and check. You can take these things back into your equations and make sure they work. All right, so you can always, on a problem like this, check yourself to make sure you didn't make any small errors or anything. Okay, questions on that, anybody? And so let's do one now that's a little bit trickier, but the same sort of concept. And so we, we, you should have thought about this a little bit because we did this uh, two days ago in our PCQ, just didn't get quite there yesterday. So here's an equation. Uh, or, or a circuit that I set up. Again, you know, we got two batteries, so there's not a clear way to solve this in terms of using uh, resistors in series, resistors in parallel. None of these resistors are in series or parallel. And so if, if that happens, then we have to go and approach this as a Kirchhoff's uh, law problem. Now what I did is I made the three currents here just to help. So I1 is the current going here. I3 is the current going here, and I2 is the current going here. So I gave them directions. And so what I want you to do is figure out what would be the, the junction rule for this here. And we'll go pretty quick through a couple of these, because you guys did really good on the PCQ for this. So I think most of us have a good feel for this. So I'll, I'll sort of go through these sort of fast. But this is the junction rule, uh, which is dealing with the currents. So maybe I'll give you 10 seconds on this one. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, call time on this. Let's see what we got here. Uh, we do see that the, the majority of us uh, think that it's A, so that's good. And so uh, I agree with that. And so if you look, you know, again, we're doing the junction. You want to look at this junction right over here. So, so maybe look at that point right there. If I look at that point right there, the currents coming in are I1 and I2. So I have I1 and I2 coming in. So I think of it like a highway. You know, you got the two, I1 and I2 coming into that point, and coming out is I3. Again, this totally depends on how you pick the currents. 
Uh, everyone could do this differently, but that's according to what the picture we have, that would be correct. Questions on this one? And, and once again, you know, if you do do it differently, it just means one of us would get a negative sign for our current later on. Um, okay, so let's do this one now. I believe this is the one we had in the PCQ. So now, according to Kirchhoff's loop rule, the left rule tells us which. So I want to do this left rule here. So talk over with your neighbors and see what you get for that one there. Uh, again, we did pretty good on this, so I won't take too much time with this. Okay, so go ahead and put an answer in. If you haven't quite got there yet, that's okay. We'll stop and talk about it. But I think it's good for us to uh, call time here and discuss this. Hopefully you got a, a feel for how this works. All right, and so I believe I agree. The clicker middle fingers, we did really good. Uh, I agree with the majority. So again, this comes down now. This is the way I like to do it. You don't have to do it, but so since I have my current I1 going this way, that would mean that this resistor would be uh, signed up like that, a positive there and a negative. So the current comes in at the high end and goes down and leaves at the low end. Uh, and again, over here, I'd have a positive and a negative like that. And so uh, let's just mix things up a little bit because on my videos, I didn't do that. Let's call this point A and let's just be crazy and go counterclockwise from point A, all right? So counterclockwise from point A, just to sort of show that it works no matter what you do. So if I go counterclockwise from point A, I come to the negative sign first, and that would be negative I1 times 3 ohms. So that's the first thing I come to. Again, for uh, uh, the potential, the voltage drop for a resistor is our good old friend I times R. And so the first one I come to is that negative. I come over to here. The next I come to would be positive. 12 volts, and then I come over to here, and then the last sign I come to first is negative, so it'd be negative I3 times 6 ohms, and then I get back to A, and so I say equals to zero. All right, so now we look here, and actually doing it that way, you come out with this pretty much almost this exact equation. Now, again, you could have done it and gotten you know, this sign to be positive, this sign to be negative, and this sign to be positive. That's what would have happened if you went clockwise. Uh, but again, since it's equal to zero, being off by negative sign is no big deal. It's the same equation. And in fact, if you look here, the, the numbers are kind of switched around. But this is, in fact, the same equation. All right? Questions? And again, this is almost always where someone makes a mistake is somewhere either setting up the negative signs or writing them down. Because of course, if you go through and solve these equations with one negative sign off, it throws everything off, right? Um, so question two asks us to find the left loop. But isn't it true that if we use the answer we found from this equation, we would not find the correct values for each current since we disregarded the other loop in battery? So that's a really great question. So one thing that's really nice, and, and, and sometimes this can really help you out, is you don't need all the loops to get all the information you need. All right. So basically, all three of the loops will be true. And what can happen, is, especially with a really complex one of these, if you can find one loop, like that one we did before, where right away you can solve for the current, do it. And that's totally fine. All the loops should be true, no matter what else is going on. And so that's what's really nice about this, is you don't necessarily have to, you know, if you, you know, can solve for something with one loop, you don't need to worry with the other loops. Now, you won't always be able to do that. Um, but uh, once you write them out, they're independent equations. 
Okay, so let's try this one here. Just give us another uh, example real quick. And so now we want to do the right loop. And so let's see, so I think we had about 84% on that last one. Let's see if we can go a little bit higher. Maybe get a little bit higher percentage on this one here now that we're getting better at this stuff. Okay, so I think we're doing okay on this one, so I'll go ahead and call time here. Yeah, it looks like we did a, about the, roughly the same, so a little bit lower, though. Um, but that's okay. We didn't actually do this one the other night in homework, I guess. Uh, so I agree with this one right here. Uh, and again, if I write down my signage on this, uh, so it would be the same one over here. It's the same I3 we were dealing with. And now I2 is this and this right here. And again, I'll just start at this point A just to kind of go backwards. And I'll go uh, clockwise uh, for this one here um, just to kind of, again, mix it up a little bit. So I start here. I get to that negative sign first. So it would be negative. Now the current going through there is I2. Uh, and the resistance is 4 ohms for that first one. All right, then I come down to that battery, and I get plus 12 volts, and then I come up, and I get negative I3, 6 ohms, which then equals to zero. Uh, and again, if you look at the equation here, this is an example of where my equation and the equation that's the right answer is off by a negative sign, right? So I got negative for the two resistors and a positive here. They have backwards, and of course, they have the thing switched up, but they do have an I2, 4 ohm and an I3, 6 ohm. And again, if we're doing this here, so I start at A, uh, the first sign. So the reason we write these positive, or one reason we write positive and negatives is just to help us make this equation. So if I start here, I get negative 4 times I2, because that's the current that's going through that one. Remember, this current here has to be continuous. I come down here, the first sign I come to is positive, and the, the voltage for the battery is easy. It's just the voltage of the battery plus 12. I come over to here, and then here the first sign I come to is negative. The current here is I3, and 6 is the resistance. And so that's my uh, second equation. Questions on this, anybody? OK, and so this next one here, we'll just go ahead and uh, skip it, just because I think we're getting pretty good at this stuff. Um, and so here, this is the outside loop. Uh, again, if I want to do this, I would have a, a plus right here and a minus, and over here a plus and a minus. And again, let's just start at our point A just to make things consistent. Um, and so if I start at point A and uh, go clockwise, I would get a negative I2 times 4 ohms, and then I get a positive 12 volts. I come over to here, and then I get a negative 12 volts from the other side, because I come to that negative sign first, and then a positive I1 times 3 ohms. And again, that equals 0, and so the, the 12s cancel out, which is nice. And so I get negative I2 times 4, which is what we have here, and I1 times 3. And again, just like the last time, you know, the signage I have is different than the signage that you know, the person that wrote this question has. But again, that's the same equation. Question? Say again now? So yeah, so, so that's the thing. So what we did is we just guessed. You know, I just guessed directions. All right. Now, if you want, you can, you can get kind of better at knowing kind of which way it might be going. But there's not necessarily an advantage to that, because what will happen is if you guess wrong, your answer for that current will just be negative 
in the end, and you'll know that you guessed the wrong direction. So for me, I don't spend too much time, because that's the whole point. These circuits are pretty complex, and so it's just sort of easier to use Kirchhoff's rules to try to interpret them. Um, other questions? All right, and so here's, uh, we had this for last night. So last night, and, and we did really well on this. So this is literally just algebra, okay? The physics at this point is done. Uh, it's just, an, you know, so you have a bunch of equations, and you have three unknowns. And this one is harder than the last one, okay? So what I think I'm going to do is, uh, so here's the answers, all right? So if you want to check yourself out, you can use these as the answers. I'm going to make a video basically just going through this algebra, because I know it is tough. Um, uh, you know, so we're going to go through that algebra in a video and just sort of skip it here, because I think most of us got it. You know, some of us maybe need some help remembering how to do the algebra and stuff. Uh, but there's the answers if you want to check yourself. And I'm just going to make a video for this you guys can look at over the weekend. Uh, but questions, anybody else questions then on the procedure of how we did this? And, and the basic principle is, you know, when you're doing this, the algebra, essentially what you want to do is, so you've got basically, there's none of these equations you can solve right away. But like here, you've got an equation for I1 and I2, and here you've got an equation for I1 and I3, something like that. And so what I would typically do is solve this equation for I2, solve this one for I3, and then plug them into here, and your equation will only depend on I1. Okay, that's one way to do it. There's, there's a, lots of ways to do it. Uh, and the thing is, once you get one of these, then you pretty much got the rest. Okay, so the, getting the first one is the hard part. This is about as hard of one of these as you're ever going to have. So if you can do this one, we really can't make the algebra harder uh, without just being really a big jerk. Um, okay, questions, anybody? Okay, so now we're getting to the part of the semester where we get to do some really cool electronic stuff. And so here's the first one we're going to do. Uh, and so this is just, it's just literally a really big capacitor. And what we're going to do is I'm going to charge it up. And so this really big capacitor, yes, yeah, so this is like one of the actual things that we do that is, the guy just told me this is lethal. I didn't know that. Uh, so whatever you do, do not come mess with it afterwards. Um, but we're going to charge this thing up to something in the neighborhood of about uh, like 6,000 volts. And then when we discharge it, if it works, it'll be quite a ride. Okay, so let's see how this goes here. And of course, it does not seem to be working. Okay, here we go. Okay, so we're at, we're at about 2,000 volts, 3,000 volts. So see, in, in physics, you got two kinds of researchers. You got people who do experiments who are really good with their hands and good at setting up stuff, and you got people who do more theory. I'm more theory, so this, so I'm, I can kind of like literally on my my job interview for this uh, for this job, I was doing a demo with like tennis balls and basketballs. Maybe you saw it from last semester, and I did it wrong, and the tennis ball came right off, like directly at a person in the front row, right? And she like did this kind of like matrix type stuff to get out of the way, right? And I'm so glad because I don't know if I would have gotten the job if she hadn't. Um, <laughs> so so be real careful here. Okay, you guys ready? So this, this will be loud. That's the whole idea is that, so we're, we're going to discharge a whole bunch of charge, okay, through this thing. And the first rule about electronics is only use one hand. Um, okay, you ready? Whoa! Okay, now let's shut that off. <laughs> Whoa! So it just kind of shows you and they uh, unplug everything. <laughs> yeah, so that, that's really good for like a Friday morning. Okay, so let's move on. <laughs> All right, so our, our last topic, oh yeah, that was like a... Our last topic on circuits is RC circuits. And basically, RC circuits 
are kind of looking back at capacitors just a little bit more closely. All right, if you remember, we talked about capacitors. We charged up capacitors. We discharged them. We talked about it in a very kind of hand-wavy way. And we had, uh, you know, wires and stuff. Now, wire is really just a resistor. And so now we're going to look at this a little bit more scientifically. So here's a circuit that would be charging up a capacitor. So here's my resistor, here's my capacitor, and here's my battery. And so this would be that circuit we described, you know, I think it was in lecture 13, uh, about how to go through and uh, uh, charge up a resistor. And that's really all we're doing now. We're just trying to be a little more mathematical about it. And so here, so I'll call my current to be going this way. And so if I do my signage like we normally do, right, so I'll get this here. Now as I'm charging up the capacitor, if you remember, this side will get positive and that side will get negative, right? If you remember, like sort of what, what happens here is, uh, you know, the, the electrons sort of leave this side to come over here where the positive is. And then what that does is it then attracts, um, or electrons will then be attracted over to here. And so that's the signage of this thing here. And so your book goes through and does this. And basically what we can do right now then is just write an equation using a Kirchhoff's loop. Now this is one loop. It's, you know, so it's a little bit easier than what we were just doing. But of course it's a little bit tricky. Now if you remember, so the voltage across the resistor is IR. Anybody remember how we would express the voltage across a capacitor? Q over C, exactly. And so if I do this, let's just start here. Okay, I'll call this my point A and go clockwise. And so I'll get negative V. That's the first sign I come to. And then here, positive IR. And then over here, positive what we just said, Q over C. And I come back down and get to here. And that's my equation equals to zero. Okay, and so this is uh, here. I'll write it out again. Uh, when the book writes it out, they typically will write it out in this fashion. It's the same equation we just developed. It's just multiplied by a negative one, all right? And so this is the equation that actually describes charging up the capacitor, which we just did over here, right? And so it's just, again, being a little bit more mathematical and scientific about this. Now, what we can do is kind of think about this a little bit, and we can solve here for the I. Okay, we can look at this here. So if I'm charging up the capacitor, uh, what is that Q on the capacitor? What's that going to be when I start? Can anyone tell me? It'll be zero, right? So initially, if we look at this, at time zero, right, what happens is um, this equation that I just wrote will look something like this. It'll be I is equal to V over R, which is just Ohm's law. And so our rule, like part of the stuff that we're going to do with this equation is try to interpret how these RC circuits work. And so according to this equation, when I first start, it's like the capacitor isn't really even there. Okay, and so if you think about it, it's just like the capacitor is a wire. And so we can ignore it. So you get these questions that are like, what's the current at time zero? Well, in this case, the current at time zero, you just forget about the capacitor, erase it, put a wire there, and then think about the, the, the rest of the circuit like you would have last week or, or yesterday or whenever it was, right? And so since I is equal to VR, it's just like the capacitor is not even there. And then what happens is after a long time, okay, it blocks this out. So once uh, the Q over here gets to be the Q maximum, this current turns into zero, right? Because when you're in V maximum, right, V uh, is equal to Q max over C. That's the whole idea. When you charge up the capacitor, it becomes the same electric potential as your battery. And so those are equal, so your equation goes to zero. And so when you get these kind of equations, you basically are going to use your knowledge of circuits that we've been doing. But the way you interpret it is if it's really right after you've closed some switch, OK, you pretend the resistor is just a wire. If it's a long time, you pretend the resistor is blocking the current. And so it's kind of like you, you I'm sorry, the capacitors. Be real careful. Um, when you do this at time zero, you treat the capacitor like a wire. Excuse me, at long time later, you pretend it's like a broken piece of the circuit. So like it's basically there's a, there's a switch that opened at that capacitor. So there is nothing there. And so let's just see how well we do with sort of uh, thinking about uh, this sort of thing here. And so let's do an example. So here's 
the kind of example we might do. So in this circuit, the switch has been open for a long time so that the capacitor uh, is uncharged. Okay, so we have this new circuit. Uh, what I want to do is, what is the current through the battery immediately after the switch is closed? So the Q on the capacitor is zero. I close the switch. What is going to be the current immediately after the switch is closed? So think about this and talk to your neighbors and we'll talk about it. Okay, so definitely some controversy here, so let's talk about this one and see if it can make sense to us. Um, and so if you look at what the majority opinion was, uh, the majority opinion was C, but there's definitely a lot of people who are thinking B. So let me give you five seconds, so make sure you put something in, and we'll go ahead and call time here. Um, and I do agree with the majority. So, so what are we doing here? Who wants to talk about this uh, and sort of say what they were thinking? Anybody want to tell us what they were thinking on this one? This was a little more, yeah. It's a great way to think about it. That's great. Anybody else have a different way they thought about it? There's, you know, always with circuits, there's always different ways to think about it. I, I love that explanation. That's a great way uh, to explain it. Like, like what I would say, so again, when the circuit is just closed, we basically just cross this guy out and imagine that there's like, you know, sort of a wire connecting these two points. And so it's like the capacitor is not even there. And so if I was to then, what I would do is I would probably think about it like a circuit. Uh, and so I would say, here, here's my battery. And so there's resistor one, and there's resistor two. And so you literally just have a situation you know, where there's one a voltage and two resistors. If I combine these right, into an equivalent resistance, right, well, I get exactly as she was describing, R divided by two. Right? This is a good thing to know, is that if you have the two identical resistors in parallel like this, okay, then to get the R equivalent, you just get you know, 2 over R if you add that up. And so it's sort of a handy thing. So you, you know, I would probably put it on my equation sheet. When you happen to have two resistors that are in parallel, the equivalent resistance is R divided by 2. So then again, this is the simplest circuit in the world. And so the, the current in the simplest circuit in the world is just V divided by R divided by 2, which is 2V over R. OK? Questions on how I did that? Yeah, question up here. So, so I'm sorry. So, so repeat the question again. I couldn't quite hear. Like, so, so the capacitor charge is like the way we were talking about, right? So basically, you know, it sort of attracts an electron over, so, so it sort of works the same way we talked about it two days ago, right? But what happens is, is basically, initially, when there's no, like what, what, what the capacitor kind of does right, in our pictures is the capacitor makes itself a little battery where the voltage is sort of exactly kind of going against the voltage of our battery that's there, all right? So at time zero, it hasn't had time to charge up. And so it's not working against that battery. So you can essentially just erase it and think about it as being like a wire. Later on, you know, as it gets, it gets you know, at the end when it's really full up, it basically gets fulled up and it's going exactly against that battery and kills all the current in that particular part. Or, you know, okay, whatever it might be. Okay, that's a good question. Okay, so now let's think about the other case. Okay, so what happens then? at some long time afterwards. So what is the current through the battery after the switch has been closed for a long time? 
So we just did the sort of initial, what happens when it's been uh, switched over for a very long time. Okay, so let's go ahead and call time. If you haven't put something in, go ahead and just put an answer in now. Again, we're not graded on for correct or not. We're just graded on. All right, and this is a controversial one. This is almost like 50-50. Um, so who wants to be brave and tell us what they were thinking? Yeah. Okay, so we're saying that. Does anybody want to defend the current being zero? I mean, half of us had that. Does anybody want to say what they were thinking? Okay, so, so, so the, the key here is, is we're not asking about the current through any of the resistors in particular. We're asking for the current that's going through um, the battery. And so, yeah, so what happens here is the capacitor now acts like a break in the circuit. So it's kind of like there's sort of two ends that just aren't connected. So like uh, we were saying there, this whole part of the circuit is now ignored, but you still have the other part, okay? And so you've got to think uh, about what's going on with the other part. And so if you get rid of that middle part, you have this setup kind of looking like this here. So here's V and here's R. Uh, and so now, again, this is the simplest circuit in the world, and so the current in this case would just be V divided by R, and that's the current going through the battery. So the current going through that middle part is zero, but the question was asking about the current that's being delivered by the battery, okay? And so it, it basically, if you remember these two rules, then you can interpret at least the short-term and the long-term behavior of most RC circuits. So questions on this? Anybody? Because there was half of us who thought, yeah, yeah. Uh, so the, the resistor over there? Yeah, so, so what, what's happening here is, is we have these two paths in parallel, right? And so that capacitor is basically stopping any current from going through that one path, but there's still the other path all the way around for the current to go through. Right, and so there's still like because remember when we have parallel, there's like more that there's in, in general the definition of parallel is there's sort of two paths for it to go through. So that capacitor is stopping the current from going through that middle part, but there's still a path. There's still a continuous path all the way around for the current to go through. Right, and so even though you can't go this way, once I close this switch, there's a total path for the current to come through over here. So the the capacitor basically acts like a break in the wire here but that doesn't affect the outside part of the loop. Other questions on that? All right, so mathematically, this becomes the equation for the, uh, uh, for the thing we had way over here. So we should go back and just show. So for this, this um, so the more basic charging up the capacitor, we have a, a circuit like this here, okay, you can write out that equation, uh, it comes out to be this right here. And so what happens is, is our equation comes out to be what we call a, a differential equation, okay? And so if we go back um, to here, so, so for a person in physics like me, differential equations are really cool, right? Differential equations are, uh, you know, people will say are like the operating system of the universe. They are the things that govern how things work. Does anybody know what differential equation did you use in 2A like all the time and maybe didn't know it was a differential equation? Anyone know? So F equals MA, is that what we were going to say? 
F equals ma. So, so what is a differential equation? A differential equation is an equation that's got, um, uh, you know, basically uh, derivatives and stuff describing how things work. And so uh, the acceleration, when you're in, uh, right, uh, 2a uh, is the second derivative of the position. So this is a differential equation. Now, the differential equation we just were working with is this one here, the one we just sort of worked out. Um, so we sort of described this here. Now, if you remember, the current is dq dt. And so differential equation. So if you need differential equations, you'll, you'll do a class on differential equations. And so this is a differential equation. So this is a differential equation uh, for the charge on the capacitor as a function of time. All right, and a differential equation can have different things in it. You can have the function itself, so here's the Q. You can have derivatives of that function, so here's dQ dt. And like in this case, you can even have second derivatives of the function. So when you did F equals ma, you know, like in the first couple of weeks of 2a, when you're solving for kinematics equations, you're actually using a differential equation to solve for the position uh, as a function of time. And so here, you're going to go through, and this is a differential equation to solve for the charge as a function of time. And I, I'm just not even sure how many of us have taken differential equations classes yet. Is any, a few of us? Okay, so some of us. So basically, there's a class where what you do in the class is you learn about differential equations. You also learn how to solve them, which is basically how to find uh, this thing over here. Now, for us, we won't spend too much time on that. But here's the equation that you get. So if you do differential equations, this is actually not uh, a horrible one. And so this is the function q of t. And so if you take this function q of t and then take the derivative, which is the current, the current is dq dt. Okay, so if you take that and if you, if you take that derivative, okay, I did this a little bit earlier, uh, you get uh, q max... Uh, over RC um, e to the negative t over RC. Uh, and so if you take this thing and the Q and plug them into your differential equation, they'll all add up to be zero. So that's sort of how the solution works, is you want to sort of get a function uh, that behaves with that special, in that special way. And so again, this is the equation that tells us that. Okay, so I just wanted to kind of just kind of introduce you to this if you haven't seen it before, but we won't spend too much time on this question. Yeah. So anything that I didn't call a function would be constant. So like Q max is a constant, R and C are a constant, but the, the Q as a function of time is not a constant. So in this thing here, in that uh, equation or that circuit we had, the only thing that's not constant is the charge. Okay, other questions on this? Okay, and so, yeah, and so, and then what this will be, uh, this thing here, so this is the equation I just wrote in legible form. Uh, the time constant is this thing here. And so this thing, this R and this C, they tell you basically how fast this exponential does what it does. So the, if you graph this, it basically looks like this and comes up to some point constant and stops. And so this this uh, RC sort of tells you how fast that happens. So that tau RC, the time RC, is the point where you get to 63% of whatever the maximum is. And so again, this equation is where we're, we're charging up our capacitor. And so that RC gives you a sense of how long it takes to get to 63% of that total charge. Okay, so that's sort of the physical meaning of that. And so in there, the, inside that exponential, that's sort of how that uh, behaves. Um, and then if you look at after about a time of about 10 times that RC, so if you multiply R times C, the units come out to be seconds, uh, the capacitor is about 99.99% charge. So sort of 10 times that would be the full charge of our capacitor uh, for that particular case there. Um, Okay, so I think we'll stop there just because I don't want to sort of move on. So I'll be outside if you have questions, and we'll finish this up next time. So this is the end of stuff for quiz three, just so you know. Thank you.